Alrighty, and we are back. Um, <clears throat> today is a fun day because Talia is going to be teaching us about um, about antiderivatives. So this is, uh, I think, our third to last student teaching day, and it's going to be a fun one. She ran with me, uh, ran through this with me over the weekend, and it was very nice. Um, before I hand it over to Talia, I just want to let you guys know that if you took the test online, if you took exam two online with me, those are graded. If you took exam two at the testing center, I am still working on them. I know that's not what anybody wants to hear, but it's just it's a procedure. It takes a while, so I promise you I am, I am grinding these out as quickly as I can. If you took the test online, it's done. You can go in there and look at the comments. Please do that. If you took the test in person, I should have those done for you either today or Wednesday, depending on what kind of free time I can find. Um, I am going to make Talia a co-host so she can take over and teach us about antiderivatives. Let's see, I'll make both of these instances co-hosts. Alrighty, and then Talia, since you're signed in here twice, just make sure you have one of them muted and one of them with the audio on so folks can hear you, but we don't get too much feedback. And then let me change the, let's see. I'll spotlight this for everybody. And um, there we go. All right, so you may want to maximize Zoom um, since she's not gonna, gonna use the screen share, it won't take over automatically, um, but I have set it to the uh, spotlight view for everybody. So Talia, take it away. All right, um, hi, today I'm gonna be teaching you guys about antiderivatives. So the definition of an antiderivative is that an antiderivative, which I'm going to um, abbreviate as AD, an AD of a function F is a function whose derivative is F. Um, so basically, we signify antiderivatives with capital letters. So the antiderivative F is an AD of F if the antiderivative of F is equal to F. So I'm gonna go through some basic examples and basically the way the antiderivatives work is reversing the power rule. So you have to think about this backwards. So for example, if we have f of x is equal to x cubed, then we need to find what capital F of x is. So in this case, capital F of x is equal to 1 fourth times x to the fourth power. And this is because we know that to reverse this um, with the power rule, uh, it's going to be minus 1 then it's going to be brought down here so it'll even out. So let's try to find the derivative of capital F of X. So F, capital F prime of X uh, is equal to, we bring this down, 4 over 4 times X to the 4 minus 1, which would be 3. So this would equal X cubed, which is equal to F of X. Uh, so basically, capital F of X, just to reiterate, is equal to one fourth times X to the fourth power. So uh, does that make sense so far? So far, so good. Just a little comment. It looks like we might have a bit of a bandwidth issue. So after you write each line, maybe just pause for a second, make sure everybody has time for the thing to load in. Um, and if there's any sort of uh, any applications running that are consuming bandwidth, we might want to turn the others off besides Zoom. But yeah, everything looks great so far. Awesome. Okay, so moving on, I'm going to do another example that's similar to this. So we need to find the antiderivative of the function f of x is equal to x to the fourth power. So again, this would be equal to capital F of x equals one fifth times x to the fifth power. And this is because the derivative of capital F of x is equal to five over five or one times x to the 
five minus one, which is four, which is equal to x to the fourth power. And here it's important to note that uh, when you're finding the derivative of a function, any constants are gonna be eliminated. So if we had capital F of x is equal to one fifth times x over five, uh, x to the fifth power plus eight, the derivative of this function would still just be x to the fourth power. So the same thing would happen if you had plus like 10 or plus 100. These constants are going to be eliminated when you find the derivative. So therefore, you can have any constant and the antiderivative is still going to be the same. So this is signified by the letter C for constant. So here the antiderivative of f of x is equal to one over five times x to the fifth power plus any constant C. So that brings us to theorem one. Which says if capital F is an antiderivative of F on an interval I, then the most general antiderivative of F on I is capital F of X plus C. So let me write this down. If F is an antiderivative of f on an interval i, sorry, interval i, then the most general antiderivative of f on i is capital F of X plus C, so plus any constant C. And so here to kind of show this with a graph, uh, we need to find the general antiderivative of F of X is equal to X squared. So find the general antiderivative of F of X is equal to X squared. So again, this is using the reverse of the power rule to find the antiderivative. So the antiderivative is equal to one over three times x cubed and then plus any constant c. So if we were to uh, make this constant c equal to, for example, one or zero or negative one, the graphs of these various functions with these different constants would be vertical translations of each other. So if I were to draw the graph of capital F of X is equal to one third X cubed, it would look something like this. So this is Y is equal to one third X cubed. Now, if we had the function Y is equal to one third X cubed minus one, well, the graph would look something like this. Similarly, if we had y is equal to one third x cubed plus one, the graph would look something like this, and you know, going on if you have different constants. So all of these functions, uh, when you find the derivative of these, it's still going to be equal to x squared, but the constant just changes uh, the vertical translation. So next, I want to show you guys some various anti-differentiation uh, formulas. And these, I'll try to prove three of them. But essentially, you just need to memorize these. They make uh, finding derivatives a lot easier. So here are the anti-differentiation formulas. So on this side, I'll have the function. On this side, I'll have the antiderivative. So here, a constant c times the function f of x. Well, the antiderivative of that will be the constant c times the antiderivative of f of x. So basically, the constant just remains the same. If we have f of x plus g of x, 
the antiderivative is going to be capital F of X plus capital G of X. If we have X to the N power where N is not equal to negative one, the most general antiderivative of that is going to be X to the N plus one power over N plus one. And I'm gonna go ahead and prove this one later. If we have one over X, then the most general antiderivative is going to be the natural log of the absolute value of X. I'm gonna prove that one as well, since it's a little bit more complicated. If we have E of X, the antiderivative is just E of X, that doesn't change. If we have B of X, the antiderivative will be B of X over the natural log of B. And finally, if we have cosine of X, the antiderivative is going to be sine of X. And I'm going to run through a problem that's similar to this one as well. So I'll give you a moment to write this down and then I'll go on to the proofs. Okay, so now I'm gonna run through a few proofs of those. So this is an example in a textbook where we have to find the most general antiderivative of the following. So the first one is A, which says we need to find the antiderivative of f of x is equal to sine of x. Well, here we know that the derivative of cosine x is equal to negative sine of x, right? So therefore, if we want to end up with just positive sine of x, we need to find the derivative of negative cosine of x. And that would be equal to sine of x. So therefore, the antiderivative would be capital F of x is equal to negative cosine x plus, this is the important part to remember, any constant c. Does that make sense so far? Well, going on to b, we need to find the most general antiderivative of f of x is equal to one over x. And this one becomes more complicated because we need to start worrying about domains. So let's see here. Okay. The domain of one over x is negative infinity to zero union zero to infinity because we can't have zero in the denominator. So then we know that the derivative of natural log of x is equal to one over x, right? And the domain of natural log of x is zero to infinity. But we want these two domains to match up. So for example, could we do natural log of the absolute value of x? What is the domain of this? So we know that the, uh, if we have f of natural log, or sorry, f of the absolute value of x, x is going to be negative if the value is negative and it's going to be positive if the value is positive. So basically this extends the domain. So if we have natural log of the absolute value of X, this means that the natural log of negative X, oh, sorry, it's, it's going to mean that it's the natural log of negative X if X is less than zero. Sorry, I don't know if you can see that. If X is less than zero, 
or the natural log of positive x if x is greater than zero. So that means that the domain here is going to be negative infinity to zero union, zero to infinity. So here, if we have the derivative of the natural log of the absolute value of x, well, that's going to mean it's going to be one over x if x is greater than zero. And it's also going to be one over x if x is less than zero. So essentially, it's just going to be one over x, which is what we're trying to find, f of x is one over x. So therefore, the antiderivative of f of x is equal to one over x is capital F of x is equal to natural log of the absolute value of x plus any constant c. And we use an absolute value of x because that extends the domain to match the domain of the original function. Okay, so moving on, we have already proved uh, one over x and cosine of x. So we're gonna try to prove uh, y the function of x to the n power, y the antiderivative is as x to the n plus one power over n plus one. So that is going to be C. So if we're given that f of x is equal to x to the n power and n is not equal to negative one, we need to find the antiderivative of this. So if you notice, this has a power, so we can do where we reverse the power rule again. So here we know if we have the derivative of one over n plus one times x to the n plus one power, then this is actually gonna end up equaling to x to the n power. So I'm gonna try to explain why this works. So here n plus one, this is actually a constant. Therefore, we can actually remove this and put it on the outside of the derivative. So to illustrate that, we can write that one over n plus one times the derivative of x to the n plus one power is the same as this. So if we do this, and now we use the power rule, this would be equal to one over n plus one times, we're bringing this down, n plus one times x to the n plus minus one, which is just n. So therefore these cancel out and the derivative of this is equal to x to the n power. So therefore this here is the antiderivative of f of x. So if I write that out, capital F of x, is equal to x to the n plus one power over n plus one. I'm just moving this on top here, plus any constant c. So now that I've gone ahead and proved a couple of those anti-differentiation formulas, I'm gonna do an example from the textbook. I'm gonna do example three. So let's see, for example three, we need to find f if f prime of x is equal to e to the x power plus 20 times one plus x squared to the negative one power. And then we're also given that f of zero is equal to negative two. 
Okay, so let's see here. I'm just gonna double check that I have all my work in order. Right. <laughs> okay, so the first thing to remember here, recall, is that one over one plus x squared, which is essentially what we have right here, that is equal to the derivative of arctan. So therefore, if we go to find the derivative of this value here, we'll end up with f of x is equal to, remember that e to the x power, that remains the same when you find the antiderivative. So e to the x plus 20, this constant remains the same, times tan to negative one or arctan. Uh, and then from here, plus any constant C. But for this example, we actually have the tools to find what C would be in this like specific situation because we're given that F of zero is equal to negative two. So therefore, if we plug in zero to F of X, we'll get that F of zero is equal to E to the zero plus 20, I'm sorry, here I need to have of x, tan negative one of x times tan negative one of zero plus c is equal to negative two. So therefore we know that e to the zero is equal to one. So one plus 20 times arctan of zero is just zero, plus c is equal to negative two. So c is equal to negative two minus one plus zero, or c is equal to negative three. So the full antiderivative of this function here is f of x is equal to e to the x plus 20 arctan of x minus three. And this is our constant. So this one involves a few more steps, but for me, the main thing to remember is that to find the constant, you can plug in f of zero is equal to some value. Okay, so that was example three. Uh, next, I wanna show you guys example four. This is also from the textbook if you wanna look back at it later. So for example four, we need to find F if F double prime of X is equal to 12 X squared plus six X minus four. And here we're given that f of zero is equal to four and f of one is equal to one. So this is gonna take a few more steps because we're working with f double prime of x. But essentially what being able to take the antiderivative of a function means is that you can work backwards from here. You can work backwards one step and then you can work backwards another step and that should bring you just to f. So here the first thing that we need to do is to find the antiderivative of f double prime of x, because that's going to be equal to f prime of x. So this is f double prime of x. The antiderivative f prime of x is going to be equal to, so here remember, we need to keep the constant 12 times here, one third times x to the uh, third power. Here I'm using the power rule on this part, plus keep the constant six times one half x squared minus four x plus c. 
And the reason I have four X here is because the derivative of four X is just four. So here, uh, like before, uh, we will eventually need to find what C is. So, but for now, we're just gonna simplify it. So to simplify F prime of X is equal to four X cubed plus three X squared minus four X plus C. So we've just found the antiderivative of F double prime of X, but we need to go a step further. Now we need to find the antiderivative of F prime of X because that's just going to be equal to F of X. So here, the antiderivative of F prime of X is going to be equal to, we keep the constant four times one fourth X to the four, fourth power, plus we keep the constant three times one third X cubed minus four times one half X squared plus C times X plus D. And again, the reason I have C times X here is because the antiderivative of C times X will just be C up here. So if I simplify this, F of X is equal to X to the fourth power plus X to the third power minus 2x squared plus cx plus d. So now we actually have a function f of x, but the problem is we also have these two constants. And because we're given these values up here, we can find what these constants are. So the first value we're given is f of zero is equal to four. So f of zero, if we plug in zero here, all of these x's are gonna to go to zero. So we'll just have d remaining. So equals to d is equal to four. So that makes sense. So uh, zero to the fourth power is zero plus zero to the third power is zero minus two times zero to the second power is zero plus c times zero is zero plus some value d. So that means that the constant d is equal to four. So now we need to find the value of c. And we can do this by plugging in f of one is equal to one. So here, f of one, using our equation that we found, we'll get one plus one minus two plus c times one, which is c, plus now we have this value four. One plus one is two, minus two is zero. This is all equal to one, by the way. So here we'll get C plus four is equal to one. So C is equal to negative three. So our full function, I'll go ahead and write negative three in here, is going to be F of X is equal to X to the fourth power plus X to the third power minus two X squared minus three X plus four. Alrighty. So I'll give you a moment to write this work down if you'd like. And then the final topic I'll cover is going to be rectilinear motion. Okay, so basically antiderivatives are really good for analyzing objects moving in a straight line. So this is where antiderivatives tie into physics. So for this section, for rectilinear motion, which I'll write down. We need to recall that the position function S is equal to F of T and the velocity function V of T 
is equal to s prime of t, well, they're related because the position function is the antiderivative of the velocity function. And then if we have the acceleration function, a of t, well, that's equal to v prime of t. So essentially, velocity function is the antiderivatives of the acceleration function. So this ties in with what we learned earlier when we were learning about, you know, f prime, f double prime. So keeping this in mind, we can work backwards and forwards to find these different functions. So here I'm gonna do example six from the textbook. So for example six, uh, we're given that a particle moves in a straight line, it has an acceleration function given by a of t is equal to six t plus four, the initial velocity is v of zero is equal to negative six centimeters per second. The initial displacement is s of zero is equal to nine centimeters. And we have to find the position function s of t. So in this case, we're working backwards from the acceleration to find the position function. So here, a of t is equal to six t plus four. The initial velocity, is v of zero is equal to negative six centimeters per second. The initial displacement is s of zero is equal to nine centimeters. And what we're trying to find is s of t. So here, the first thing we need to do is find the antiderivative of the acceleration function, because as I already mentioned, that's going to be the velocity function. So here, if v prime of t is equal to a of t, which is equal to 6t plus 4, that means that v of t, which is the antiderivative of a of t, is equal to, we have to keep this constant no matter what, so 6 times, using the power rule, 1 half t squared plus 4t plus c. So this is going to be the antiderivative. So if I simplify this, that's equal to 3t squared plus 4t plus c. So now we have our velocity function, but we have to continue going backwards. So since v of t is equal to s prime of t, which is uh, equal to this function, which we just have here, then that means that uh, the position function is the antiderivative of the velocity function. So here, s of t is equal to, we keep this constant three, use the power rule, one third times t cubed, plus keep the constant, four times one half t squared minus, oh, you know what, I skipped a step. So now that we've found the velocity function, we actually need to find the constant right now. So if we're given that the constant of v of zero is equal to negative six, that means if we plug in zero here, v of zero, that's going to be zero plus zero plus c is equal to negative six. So c is just equal to negative six. So therefore, the full velocity function is v of t is equal to 3t squared plus 4t minus 6. So here, I messed up this step. So if you want to go ahead and write down the correct step, here it is. OK. So let's set it up here for now. Now that we have full velocity good. function, pardon? Oh, I said you're doing good. It's all right. Okay, thank you. So now that we have our full velocity function, we can finally find our position function. So because v of t is equal to s prime of t, 
by finding the antiderivative of v of t, we can find s of t. So s of t is equal to, we keep this constant, three times one third t cubed plus four times one half t squared minus here with this constant, we do minus six t plus any constant d. So if I simplify this, the position function s of t will be equal to t cubed plus two t squared minus six t plus d. And now we need to find the value of this constant. And if you recall from the beginning of this problem, s of zero is equal to nine. So if we plug in s of zero here, that'll be equal to zero plus zero minus zero plus d is equal to nine. The d is equal to nine here. So the full position function will be s of t is equal to t cubed plus two t squared minus six t plus nine. And that's the solution. So now I've worked through basically all the things that you need to learn for this section. And I just like to do one example that takes things a bit further. So I'm going to do example 15 from the textbook. This is question 15. So here we're given that g of t is equal to one plus t plus t squared over the square root of t. And what we want to find is the antiderivative of this. So we're trying to find capital G of t. So before we can actually start finding the antiderivative, we need to be able to break this function up. And we can do that by isolating each of these values on the top and putting it over the denominator, the square root of t. So g of t is equal to one over the square root of t plus t over the square root of t plus t squared over the square root of t. And this is an important step to remember, uh, Professor Firesticle Oh my God, Professor File Sticker uh, said that there might be some questions on the homework like this. So from here, we need to find each of these values raised to a power. So then we can use the power rule or the reverse of the power rule. So one over the square root of t is equal to t to the negative one half power plus t over square root of t is equal to t times t to the negative one half plus t squared times t to the negative one half. So if I kind of compress these, that'll be equal to t to the negative one half plus t to the one half plus t to the three half power. So now we can actually find the antiderivative of g of t. And this is using the reverse power rule with um, fractions in the power. What helps me is to remember when you bring this down, it's just going to be the inverse. So I'll show you what I mean. So capital G of T is equal to the inverse of one half is equal to uh, two times T one over two because one half minus one is equal to negative one half plus here, uh, this will be two thirds times T to the three half plus two fifths times T to the five half plus C. But I understand that this part isn't really intuitive. So I'm gonna work backwards by finding the antiderivative of capital G of T, which should be G of T, to show you why this works. So if I were to find the antiderivative of capital G of T, 
here, we'll bring down one half. So two over two times T one half minus one, which is negative one half plus two thirds times three halves. We're bringing that down times T three halves minus one is one half plus two fifth times five halves times T three over two. So if we simplify that, that'll be equal to T to the negative one half plus T to the one half plus T to the three halves, which is equal to G of T. So therefore that proves that this solution is correct. And so for problems like this, what helps me is to try to really think of it backwards, to try to think of if five half is, you have to like subtract one from that. And it's just thinking about the power rule in reverse. So that's the end of what I have for you guys for today. Do you have any questions? Okay, in that case, I'm finished. Very nice. So let me, um, I'll slide over here and just talk for a second and then let you guys go. This is a, a fairly straightforward lecture. And uh, yeah, first and foremost, I really want to commend you for, um, oops, sorry, grading Calc 2 tests. I want to commend you for the work that you've put in here. This uh, I, On Saturday when we met to, to go over what you've done so far, I was really impressed by how much preparation you'd put in. Um, the clarity of your delivery, it was, it was uh, very, very clear that you had invested a lot of time in making sure you both understood the material um, and were comfortable communicating the material. And those are the two, two things that it really takes to deliver a nice lecture. So um, above all else, really nicely done, really beautiful. Um, and I, I encourage <clears throat> anybody who still has to do their student teaching to take some notes from this. This is a really nice way to do things. And it's fairly... Um, low, maybe higher pressure, but slightly less work, I think, than preparing a video ahead of time. Delivering a live lecture is, is a very nice thing because you kind of get to think along with the person who's talking. Um, what did I want to say here? So uh, you touched on all of the important examples. Uh, what I would like to do is just really quickly recap the, the total collection of um, antiderivative formulas that we have, because there are some rules. Uh, and while you, while you touched on them, I think it would be nice to get these in here somewhere in the, in the very end to make sure we can slap that table into our notes. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, a few, a few of these things uh, we didn't mention explicitly and the first couple columns there. So let's do this. If um, capital F prime is equal to little f, i.e. f is an antiderivative to a little f, then um, the original and antiderivative. Um, and let me also say capital G prime is equal to little g, i.e. Big G is an antiderivative for little g. If you have, a, we used this a few times, but, um, and I went back and forth when we talked about this, whether or not we should state it explicitly, but if you have a constant times your little f function, then that constant will come along for the ride in your antiderivative. And for example, when we had the 20 times uh, one over one plus x squared, we said the antiderivative for that piece is 20 times the inverse tangent of x. Um, also, antiderivative of a sum would be the sum of the antiderivatives. Um, what else did we want to say here? Yeah, let's get the rest of these rules in here. So if you're anti-differentiating a power function, x to the n, <clears throat> um, this will be x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1. And I thought your proof of this was very nice. This works great for every value of n except negative 1, including constants like x to the 0 would have antiderivative x to the 1 over 1, or just x. Um, the sines, cosines, e to the x's, uh, 1 over x has antiderivative 
natural log absolute value of x. And this piece can be, I think a, a lot of folks kind of struggle with the absolute values and where they come from. Uh, I like the way you explained it. So the natural log of the absolute value of x is either natural log x if x is positive or the natural log of negative x if x is negative. And both of those have the same derivative, one over x. So over its whole domain, one over x has antiderivative ln absolute value x. Um, e to the x, b to the x, cos x, sin x. So e to the x is its own derivative, therefore its own antiderivative. The derivative of b to the x is b to the x times the natural log of b. So the antiderivative of b to the x is b to the x divided by the natural log of b. Um, sine, cosine, secant squared, and secant x, tangent x are certainly all worth remembering. Antiderivative for sine is negative cosine, because the derivative of negative cosine is positive sine. Antiderivative for cosine is positive sine. Uh, secant squared, another good one to just keep in your head. You know that the derivative of tangent is secant squared. So the antiderivative of secant squared x is tangent x. And we know that the derivative of secant is secant tangent. So antiderivative for secant tangent x uh, would be secant of x. So this little table of sort of known antiderivatives, we could extend it further. Um, we use the 1 over 1 plus x squared, and uh, there's also the inverse sine fellow. So since the inverse tangent derivative is 1 over 1 plus x squared, the antiderivative for him is inverse tangent x. And you could do this for all of the inverse trig functions, but here I'm just trying to write down the ones that we use a lot. So barring hyperbolic functions, these are kind of the, the fundamental antiderivative rules that we need to remember. The reason for the n not equal to negative 1 here is because when n is negative 1, we're talking about 1 over x, and he's special. So when you're looking at power rule stuff, make sure you are clear whether you're in the top case here or the bottom case here. Um, other things people forget, I often catch out my Calc 2 students early on by asking them to integrate something like 3 to the x or 5 to the x. Um, or that is, find an antiderivative for 3 to the x or 5 to the x, same, same sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> of course, your basic trig function stuff and your basic inverse trig function stuff, these are the, the ones that I think it would be worthwhile to have all of them together at one place in your notes, um, because these are the ones that we use quite a bit. Is there anything else we want to say here? I think that's about it. Uh, Talia did a, a really nice job covering everything. Differential mm -hmm. equations. Yeah, I don't. I don't think you missed anything else in here. Um, maybe just one little note, and that's those problems. So. This is not so much an additional thing, it's just a bit of vocabulary. Problems where you are given f primed of x and f of zero, then are told to find the original function f of x, um, these are a special type of differential equation. Our special differential equations. And you know, we have a class here called differential equations, where you go deep into stuff like this. These are called um, initial value problems, specifically uh, first order. initial value problems. And the idea is that the derivative, if you have the derivative, um, then you know the slope of your function everywhere. Um, 
from that slope, you can construct a family of possible curves, all of which, like Talia said, are vertical translates of one another. And then using the information you have from this f of zero, which is called the initial condition, you can pick out a particular one. Um, but really, that's, that's it. That's it. Uh, you did a, a wonderful job there. And, and uh, I think everybody has all the things they need to dig into the antiderivative homework and, um, and move forwards. So Luke, next time, I am going to talk about the fundamental theorem of calculus which is where we're taking this stuff, antiderivative stuff, and we're gonna connect it to what we were doing last week with definite integrals. Um, it turns out that there is a, a magical connection between areas under curves and antiderivatives. And we saw just the tiniest inkling of that with the last example that we did on Friday, looking at the area under 2t uh, from zero to x. So next time we will do that in earnest and um, what else? Oh, I see Daniel's asking is next week, the 22nd. Let me take a quick look at our schedule here, Daniel. Ah, yes, the lecture will go up today. We do have another student teaching event um, coming up soon in addition to that. Is this the good one? So Daniel, are you doing... indefinite integrals and net change. So Daniel, um, I think when we spoke, we were, we were leaning towards either Wednesday or Friday of this week. So I'll definitely be doing uh, the fundamental theorem of calculus on Wednesday. Um, it's possible that this will take multiple days, that the fundamental theorem of calculus will, will be a two-day lecture. It kind of depends on, on how well people absorb that. So there's two parts to FTC. But I think probably we'll get through through all of it on Wednesday. So um, I think we've, we've had the chance to talk once, but I think it would be good to talk at least one more time really quick to make sure that you're ready to go for either Friday or Monday. So if we make it all the way through section 5.3 um, on Wednesday, then you would be up on Friday. If not, then you would be up on Monday. So yeah, Friday at the earliest, otherwise next Monday, the 22nd. Already, I do see that extension request. I will make sure to get in there and grant that. Uh, so on Wednesday, we will be covering section 5.3, which is on the fundamental theorem of calculus or fundamental theorems. There's really two of them. Um, and then after that, Daniel will be teaching us 5.4 on indefinite integrals and the net change theorem. So certainly Wednesday will be all 5.3. Since we already introduced this a little bit, I think it's likely that we will get through all of 5.3 on Wednesday, which means Friday most likely will be Daniel's student teaching on 5.4. So those are our next two classes and that's what we'll be looking at, at this week. So this week it's antiderivatives, the fundamental theorem of calculus and indefinite integrals. All right. Any other questions from you guys? Yep, office hours today, one to two. Yeah, what's up, Amy? Um, on the study guide, if you have a concept question, something that's like just sketching a graph or asking asking a kind of Quanti or qualitative question rather than quantitative, just write me a sentence explaining your logic. So if you're sketching a graph, you know, sketch the graph for me. Um, if it's like asking, you know, uh, I guess it would depend on the particular question, but just explain your logic a little bit. So if you feel like it's not a question where you need to show calculation work, just writing a sentence explaining to me your thought process will be sufficient. Yeah, and that's okay. I don't mind taking study guides late. Alrighty then, if those are all the questions, then the only other thing I wanna do is remind you guys, please send me drafts of your honors papers as we get closer to the end of the semester. Remember, those are going to be due on December 3rd, I think is our last day of class. 
Yeah, December 3rd. So it's closer than it feels, right? It's just about three weeks out, three and a half weeks out. So make sure that you're working on that honors paper. And I, I strongly advise you to send me a draft um, so that we can talk about it a little bit. Um, and that is it. That's it from me for now. So next time, Fundamental Theorem of Calculus is going to be a good day. Um, make sure you commit these antiderivatives to memory. I will be popping open a fresh homework and uploading this lecture in the next few minutes. If you want to talk to me, I have an office hour from 1 to 2. Otherwise, you can always Canvas message or email. And that is it, lads and ladies. I will see you guys on Wednesday.